morning. My name is Pastor Eugene Taylor. Welcome to Emmanuel Church of Christ. There are many things you could be doing. I appreciate you spending time with us. I just want to start with a quick prayer before I get into the sermon. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be in the house of the Lord this one more time. You didn't have to break up this morning, but you did. We thank you for your health and strength and for the glory and the presence of you. Heavenly Father, as I preach the word to your people today, give me the strength and the courage to be able to speak your word with clarity and conviction. Heavenly Father, as I speak your word, let the word go out and not come back void. Let the word fall on good ground. We ask you to just bless us and keep us and want to learn more about you. We ask in this, in your son, in Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible with you, turn your Bible to Exodus, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 5. I'm using the King James Version. It's Exodus, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 5. It's up on the screen, so it reads, then Moses said, What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? Well, they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A staff. Then he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand and grasp it by the tail. So he stretched out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. For well, they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. I want to use for a subject today. What's in your hands? What's in your hands? The Lord said to him, What's in your hand? And he said, Staff. Before I tell you about what's in your hand, I'm going to give you a little bit of background to bring you forward to so you know where I'm at. Pharaoh was worried about the Hebrews becoming too numerous back then. He was worried about them becoming too strong. If they became too strong, his army couldn't control them. So what he tried to do was make them, or try to break their spirit, make them less strong. What he gave was gave them extra work, extra laboring, to try to break their spirit so they could control them. But that didn't work. The population continued to grow, continued to grow and thrive and get more and more people, more and more births. To prevent this from happening, he talked to the midwives. He told the midwives to kill the baby boys born to Hebrew women. But that didn't work too, because that didn't work either. Because the midwives said they give their own they have babies themselves. They don't use the midwives. So Pharaoh, in his infinite wisdom, ordered that they be thrown into the Nile River, you know, because the midwives were doing the job. So they stoned in the river. See, well, God has a plan. You don't worry about that. You still overcome. So Moses was a Hebrew boy himself. He escaped. He was put into the Nile River. He was hidden in, the, in a basket in the Nile River. And one of Pharaoh's daughters, daughters picked him up and raised him as his own. So Moses was raised as a prince of Egypt. But one day, he killed an Egyptian who was beating Hebrew slaves. And he fled to Midian. When he got to Midian, he married Zephora. He became a shepherd boy. While well, he was a shepherd, out by himself somewhere, he saw a burning bush. And he was curious, like you and I. He went to see the burning bush. And God said, take up the shoes from your holy ground. God spoke with him and called him to lead the Israelites out of slavery and lead the Israelites into the promised land. Then Moses said, What if they don't believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. For the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A staff. What is a staff? It's like a crooked object, or it could be a, a straight stick or a stick with a crook on the end. It was used to hook the sheep's head and guide them back into the flock. The rod represents God's discipline. The staff represents God's guidance. Both are used to protect the sheep from harm. They're symbols of leadership, symbols of authority. 
like you and I can compare us to sheep because we're stray away sometimes too. Psalm 23 says, your rod and your staff, they come from me. So the shepherds carry the rod and staff is essential for their work. It's like a, a, a electrician, having an electrician gauge is essential for their work. They would rescue the sheep. One time it was a lion or a bear was going out. They would rescue him from the flock from the sheep. I mean, he rescued the sheep from a bear or a lion. He struck it and rescued it from his mouth. When he turned on him, he seized it by his hair, struck it, and killed it. So shepherd riot was a weapon. He also used the shepherd riot to count the sheep. Sheep are like you and I today. They're notorious wonders. They get into mischief when they shouldn't be. They just wander away. They don't pay attention. The shepherd has to have a, a watchful eye. It looks like God has a watchful eye over us. He wants the best for us. A shepherd wants the best for his sheep. So if a sheep became trapped in a precarious situation, the shepherd will help him. It's like you today. You think you're trapped in a situation? You think there's no way out? God will help you. There's always a way out. A staff is like a tool. It's like a tool in a mechanic's hand. It'll work. You need a tool in a mechanic's hand. It's like you got a it's like a tool in a mechanic's hand. It's like a basketball in Steph Curry's hand. Or it's like a football in Patrick Mahomes' hand. Or like a gun in a police hand. So what's in your hand? What's in your hand, saints? I want to talk to you today about three different points. I want to talk to you about hands. I talk to you about lifting hands. I talk to you about the power in your hands. Then Moses said, what if they would not believe me? What's that in your hand? He said, a staff. He threw the staff on the ground and became a servant. Picked it back up became a staff again. So Moses and Aaron, they used a the staff to bring plagues of blood on people. The staff brought frogs. The staff brought lice. They brought hell, locusts. He used a staff to take water out of a rock. He used a staff to part the Red Sea. Notice the staff did nothing by itself. That's the staff that's in somebody's hand. So without some being in somebody's hand, the staff didn't work. So what's in your hands? So what are hands? Hands are more than just someone in your, your arms. Hands are important. Hands are tools at the end of your arms. Hands can build stuff. Hands can destroy stuff. God provides blessings and healings through hands. Hands can create beauty. Hands can create malicious intent. We use hands to, for everything we do. We wash dishes with hands. We write words with hands. We clap and show appreciation with hands. God created our hands to do work for God's kingdom. They're not just for you, they're for God's kingdom too. God gave each hand the unique ability. They're all separate. We have different, different fingerprints with each hand. So God made us unique. Each hand has five fingers. The number for grace is five. The four fingers are weak, but the thumb makes the home strength. They have a God for strength. With these hands, there are ten fingers in a hand, like the law of establishment, like the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. Hands are used for labor. Fingers are used for writing. Fingers are used for pointing. Or if you point somebody, four fingers are pointing back towards you. Hands are used for touching. Believe it or not, your hands are God's tool to use in the church. If you go to church, you can be an usher with your hands. Guide people with your hands. Volunteer in Sunday school, teach Sunday school with your hand. Go on a mission trip with your hands. Invite someone to church with your hand. Gesture with your hands. Deliver a meal to someone with your hands. Using your hands to give you physical stuff and spiritual stuff. For example, you use your hand to give somebody a coat. You use your hand to give somebody food. You use your hand to give somebody shelter. You use your hand can be used for financial means. In other words, use your hands to to write that tithing check. Use the hands to write a check for someone. Everyone has something to offer. offer. Many people say, I don't have nothing to offer. That's not the truth. You always have something to offer. You have time. You have talents. There's this poor woman. It was just rich people go to church and put like thousands of dollars in church, but they give out of abundance. But this poor widow woman came to church and put in two small coins, which amount to like a, the amount of a penny. But Jesus said that was more because she gave all she had. She gave it out of her poverty. So she had to live when she gave you. She was a true heart. So you can give of your time. Give of your talent. Give your money. God knows your heart. People also use their hands to communicate. You say, how so? The blind people use their hands to read braille. Deaf people use their hands for sign language. Use their hands for all different kinds of gestures. Positive and negative. Use their hands to clap. 
We got a good sermon to use your hands just to point at somebody or give obscene gestures. When you're in a hospital, sometimes the nurses come around and, and they'll say, touch a lot of open, we'll touch you and touch you, feel it. Use the hands to make you feel good. Like it comforts you to use somebody's hand. Ask a medical person, a person about a medical person. If you're a mother, your child is crying or hurt his knee or something, you touch it, rub it, kiss it, you know, use your hands. It soothes. Hands hold things. When children are small, they get something like a toy or something. They say, that's mine, that's mine. Whatever's in the hand, they say, it's mine. So I, I'm asking you, saints, what's in your hands? God placed a lot of things in your hands. You got to use what God gave you rightly. God placed money in your hands. God placed possessions in your hands. God placed influence in your hands. God placed talents in your hands. God placed glory in your hands. So sometimes what we withhold from God stops our blessing. So what you hold in your hand reveals your heart. If you have money in your hands, you close your hands, it won't go out. If you open your hands up and other words, give out stuff to people, give stuff out to money, it'll come back to you. But if your hands close, you can't get nothing. So what is in your life that you won't let go of? When you release something that you hold on to, God has sent blessings to you. So what's in your hand? The right hand in the Bible is mentioned more times than the left hand, many, many times. The right hand is for protection. The right hand demonstrates trust. The right hand demonstrates honor. Sometimes you go to a king's place or a palace or somebody high dignitaries, it says it on the right hand side. It's, it illustrates the hand, it illustrates power. The right hand illustrates power because a lot of warriors are, well, most warriors are right handed. So the power is on that right side. You sit on a person's right hand side, and they just able to hand you remove their power. Also, hands are also creative. They able to paint different paintings and everything. The mechanics use the hand for tools. You do pose and painting and do all kinds of stuff with your hands. The hands are creative. It comes from your creative mind. The left hand, I'm not saying the left hand is not important, but the left hand is like, the left hand is also important too. You got a right hand, you got a left hand. Sometimes you got a right hand, the left hand has to support the right hand. But the Bible don't speak too much about the left hand, but if you're a sheep, you've been on the right hand side. If you're a goat, you've been on the left hand side. <laughs> but I'm not speaking about the right left hand, but there was also these uh, 700 left hand warriors. They were so good that they could hit a hair with a stone. So God uses our, can't, our hands to carry out his will. But Jesus, in his youth years, used his hands. He was a carpenter. I don't know what kind of hands he had, but I imagine he probably had rough hands because carpenters used their hands all the time. I don't know, but just because it was rough, though, when he could use them, just remember to consider the blind man as Peseda. He just took him by the hand. He brought him to a quiet, still place. Then he spat on his eyes, put his hands. Then the man could see. Remember the man with leprosy. He asked to be healed. He just reached out and touched him, and he was healed. Remember Peter, we got out of the boat. He's out there. He's had confidence at first, like you and I. Then after a while, things got hard. He started to sink. He just reached out with his hand and saved him. What about the crowd of 5,000 we fed with his hands. The Satan knew how powerful Jesus' hands was that when he went to the cross on Calvary, they put nails and nailed his hands to things. He's in a grave all Friday night, Saturday day, Saturday night. On the third day he rose with all power in his hands. So what's in your hands? Lifting your hands. We say lifting your hands. Some people live that. Lift their hands for like a connection with God. Like, a, like back in the old days, you had these televisions, you get no reception, you turn it uh, and turn it in a different direction, left, right, whatever, up and down, put it in a renter's wrap on it, get a better reception. So lifting your hands gives you better reception to God. So lifting your hands is like surrendering to God. Lifting your hand is like sur hearts are surrendering to God. Mm -hmm. Lifting your hands, you lift your hands to bless God. We honor God by lifting our hands and worship. We lift our hands from adoration. I think David said, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift my hands. Raise your hands in worship. Sometimes, in moments of worship, you can't keep your hands down. It's like a reflex. You feel so good. The spirit gets in your body. You got to catch this still. You raise your hands. The Bible says, I desire that every place that man should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or calling. You may raise your hands as a form of prayer, forms of praise. Lift your hands this is a way of reaching up to God. Tell God, I need you. I surrender all. Come to me. Isaiah, the 19th chapter, verse 16 says, We see our strength through God's hands. 
people say you see God's footprint and the handprint in the sky. You see all the, the stars and all the creations and everything. That's God's hand. So when life gets tough, then you can't go no more. Lift your hands to God. If you got a problem you can't solve, lift your hands and pray. Offer yourself to God and He'll help you solve the problem. He may not get you out of the problem, but He'll help you get through that problem. So prayer connects you to God. It's a connection of body and mind. Prayer is a cry, is a cry for help to God. Psalm 28 says, Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy. When I cry to you for help, when I lift my hands up toward your most holy sanctuary. Lifting your hands is a weapon. Moses was in a battle against the Amalekites. When he held his hands up, the prayer and supplication, when he held his hands up, he was winning the battle. If you let them down, they wouldn't win the battle. So when life throws an obstacle at you, lift your hands. They help you conquer your other things going on in your life. This goes to my last point. Use your hands for spiritual battle. My last point is the power in your hands. Satan, I guess he's smarter, how do you want to say cunning or whatever you know, but Satan figured out a long time ago, he figured out Christians have power in their hands. If Satan gets your hand, D, it keep you out of heaven. Don't let Satan get your hand. Like you like Satan get in your car, you drive you too far, take you far you want to go. Don't do that. But trusting in riches, in riches can keep a person out of heaven. Remember the rich young ruler? Jesus was on a journey, and the rich young ruler came to him and said, Good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. He said, you know the commandments. You don't murder. You don't commit adultery. You don't steal. You don't give talk, talk false testimony. You don't defraud. You honor your mother and father. And he said, teacher, I've kept all these commandments. Then Jesus knew the man's heart and said, give up all you possess and follow me. The man was sad because he had much wealth. Much poverty. He didn't want to give it up. So what is it was in his hand kept him from having eternal life. So maybe it's not money that's keeping you out of heaven. Maybe it's, maybe it's drugs keeping you out of heaven. Maybe it's fornication keeping you out of heaven. Maybe it's some other addiction keeping you out of heaven. But let me tell you a secret. They all work the same. Either your hand is kept by God or your hand is kept by Satan. Is your hand in Satan's hand? Like I said earlier, Satan is cunning. Satan is sly. Satan does a lot of things to get us off our track. We have good Christians, real good Christians. They've been around a long time. You know, they know the word of God and back and left. But still, the good Christians, the old Christians, the mature Christians, the elders and the preachers and the teachers and the bishops, they still fall for Satan's tricks. I know you people here haven't fought for Satan's tricks. But Satan has a, a simple trick. We're working thousands and thousands of years. He has a, Satan has a trap. I call it a monkey trap, you know. Satan uses a monkey trap. I'm not saying you're monkeys or nothing, but Satan got this monkey trap to keep catch Christians with it. You know, if you all been to the zoo, you might have been to the Nashville Zoo or something, or if you haven't been to the zoo, you've seen a monkey on television. If you're in South America, they probably roam around. Wow, there's so many different species of monkeys, like 600 species of monkeys. Large and small all over. And monkeys have been said to be some of the most intelligent animals. They even say we came from monkeys. I don't know, but they say we came from monkeys. I know God created the earth and created created earth in the Bible, but they say we came from monkeys. Monkeys are also that that's cute. But monkeys also can be incredible pests. And monkeys are they're so pestful they destroy crops and everything, you know, but and Farmers have a hard time catching monkeys, but you know, monkeys are high up in trees sometimes, you know, how you catch something way up and high in the tree. They figured you gotta trap a monkey to catch it. The monkey's so, so sneaky and so sly, you'd be in person in India, you got something called a microwack monkey that swoop down from a tree and steal your food. You probably seen it on TV one time before certain movies, you see the monkey come down and take somebody's food, go up there and eat it real quick. Monkeys, some monkey, the monkey meat is good, it's like a, some people say it's delicatessen. You might pay like hundred dollars just for some monkey meat. But so that's I mentioned earlier, monkeys are hard to catch. So they trap them. 
They trap monkeys almost like they trap some Christians. The reason magic monkeys are hard to catch because they're agile, they're quick, they go left and right. You can't get them, they're quick, you can't get them, you know. So they use this trap. So he said, you probably wonder in your mind, you talk about monkeys a long time, travel monkeys. How do you trap a monkey? How do you crash the, how do you trip a trap a Christian? But if you want to catch a monkey, you got to trap it. They got this gourd. It's like gourd. It's like a, it's like a, like a fruit type thing, right? It's almost like a pumpkin or uh, a cucumber or something. It's big. You take this little, probably drill a little hole in the, the gourd after it got, after it got, I guess, dry. You put some nuts or something inside or something, some nuts or some sweet or something, you know? And the monkey likes sweet stuff and everything, you know? And the monkey is like some Christians, right? The monkey, they don't notice, but the monkey put his hand in a small hole. They make the hole just small enough for the monkey's hand to go inside. And once the monkey's hand go inside, he grab the nuts. The monkey's real smart, real intelligent, like you and I. He's very, very smart. But the monkey won't let it go to nuts. He'll be trapped. He try to pull and pull and pull and pull. And the monkey, that's why he tried monkeys. <laughs> he'll keep his hand and he won't let go. He don't realize if he won't let go, he'll be trapped. So the, the farmers or whoever comes, the hunters come out and trap the monkeys. He won't let go. What he has in his hand, he won't let go. It reminds you of some people, some Christians and some of us today. We have some money. We're rich. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's fornication, maybe it's drugs, addiction, maybe it's a job keeping you. You won't let go of that. You can't go to heaven because you won't let go. You gotta let go. All you gotta do is open a monkey just had to open his hand up and he won't open his hand to be free. What's that? So, what's keeping you out of heaven? You have your hands on something that don't make they're not worth nothing? You have your hands on a, a handful of nuts inside of a board, you won't let go? It's keeping you out of heaven? All you gotta do is surrender yourself to God, whatever you're holding to, let it go. You know, believers don't realize how much authority, how much power they have. They have authority and power. If you just take some time and read the book, it tells you about what kind of authority you have. That's why we read the Bible, study, and pray. But we don't believe. The Bible says, my people lack knowledge. My people perish for lack of knowledge. We have power over demons. We have power to trade over serpents. Power to get wealth. Power to be creators. When you hold your hands up, what do you see? Your hands up for covering your mouth to yawn. You eat with your hand, comb your hair with your hand. Hands up, you work. Hands up, you play. When God looks at your hand, He sees something more than that. He sees potential for blessings. He sees miracles. He sees prosperity in your hands. Do you see it? Can you see it? Laying on your hands is very important too. Satan knows how important your hands are. So what about laying your hands on different people? Power transfers from you, you, or from God to you to someone else. I'm talking about hands because laying on hands is really, really important. I want you to realize how much power you have at the disposal of your hands. Someone wants to be wealthy. Power of wealth is in your hands. Someone wants a new job. Power of wealth is in your hands. Write the resume. Laying up hands does a lot of different things, but laying, laying up hands by the elders help you improve your spiritual gifts. 2 Timothy 1 and 6 says, For this reason, I remind you to fan into the flame of God, which is in you through the laying of your hands. So if you have a little power yourself, you know, somebody lays a hand on you, your power might increase. Fan the flames. Laying of your hands does healing. You see, sometimes you go to church and ministers take their hand, lay hands on people, it heals people. It heals the sick. But Paul was on the earth, he visited people and prayed for them and healed people. Laying up of your hands helped other people. Help them receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 8.17. They said they laid their hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. Laying up your hands, there's a lot of different things that transfer the power from God to that person. They said that when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they began to speak with tongues and prophesying. A lot of times before people go on these mission trips over different places across the seas, they lay their hands on them to give them a blessing. Many people in the Bible, the young sons, the older sons, they lay their hands on them to give them the blessing. The right hand was utilized mostly for the blessing. But sometimes even the left hand would give them a blessing too. But it's just a lesser blessing. It's still a blessing. But the only thing I give you one uh, a warning. Before people lay hands on you, but know that person's intentions. Know that person. Is that person of God? Because they can lay your hand on you and pray for something. We have you all kind of problems, you know. So just be careful that that person is a Christian, that person is God about God, and that person has good intentions for you. They can lay your hand and put some evil spirits into you. John, third chapter, verse 35 says, 
The father loved the son and placed everything in the son's hands. So when soldiers came to take Jesus captives, what did they do? They took him captives. The first thing they do is bind your hand. When a police, police officer gets somebody, take him to jail. First thing they do is bind your hand, put them behind you. So your hands are important. What did Jesus, Jesus did? His hands to heal the sick. He used his hand with two fishes and a loaf of bread. He fed 5,000 people. Jesus' hand stopped through possessions. He touched the body of the young boy and gave his mother a great joy when he brought a new life. So hands are powerful. So what do you do with your hands? John 14 and 2 says, no, John 14, chapter, and 12th verse says, He that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, he can do also, and greater works than he that these he shall do, because I go unto my Father. 2 Timothy says, Fan the flame, fan the flame. I never talk about a lot of stuff, but I just want you to know the importance of your hand. In conclusion, people's hands symbolize God's creativity. People's hands symbolize God's protection. People's hands symbolize joy. It was created in God's image. Our hands are vessels for us to use to bring glory to God. A staff is like a stick, but when a stick is laying on the ground, you can't use it. It's like when Moses had a staff in his hand, he had great powers, great wonders. He brought the plagues, Egypt. He brought water out of a rock. He departed the Red Sea. So what's in your hand? A Bible in your hand could be changed the nations. What's in God's hands could conquer anything. What's all, well, God think all things are possible. So what's in your hand? Thank you.